Hello, and welcome to session one of the basic tax course. Before we get going with today's session, I did want to point out the reading assignment that you need to complete. And the reading assignment comes from IRS Publication 17. IRS Publication 17 is almost 300 pages long, and we do have it loaded in the LMS so that you could read it on your computer screen or even print it. But I did want to show you real quick before we start with today's class how to go about ordering Pub17 for yourself, because the IRS will send it to you for free. So I'm just going to navigate to the internet here and go to the IRS website, which is irs.gov. OK, so here we are on the IRS website. And in the top left-hand corner of the screen, it says Forms and Publications. And I'm going to click on that. And then I scroll down the Forms and Publications page to the bottom left-hand side where it says Forms and Publications by US Mail. I click on that link. And then there's a search box. And I'm going to, inside of it, type Pub17. And that gives me the ability to order it. And I simply click the publication that I want and add it to my cart. While we're here, I should tell you that you should also order IRS Publication 946. IRS Publication 946 is the publication that is used for um, depreciation. Um, and so if you want to um, order Pub 946, you may as well get them at the same time. So let's get that in there, Pub 946, search, add it to my cart. And now I've got two publications in my basket. You can, of course, go through and order other publications while you're at it. The IRS will send them all to you for free. Um, but when you are ready to order, you simply go to View My Cart and then Check Out. And you enter your personal information, your address, and the IRS will mail those to you at no charge. It generally takes about 10 days for those documents to arrive in the mail. So now that you know how to order Pub17 so that you can complete your reading assignment, we're going to move on to the topic for today. Today is essentially uh, kind of the bare bones start of the tax return. And the bare bones start of the return is figuring out which tax form you need to file and what the filing deadlines are and who needs to file. That is, am I required to file a tax return? So we're going to be looking at some pretty basic stuff like that. We're also going to look at penalties that you have to pay if you file late or don't pay the money that you owe on time. Um, and then we're going to look at some special rules revolving around dependents. And at the end of class, we're going to actually uh, engage in some classwork assignments together. So let's begin with filing requirements and which form do I use? The IRS offers six different forms for filing your individual income tax return. Knowing which form to use is an important first step when completing your tax return. The forms that IRS has include Form 1040, the long form, 1040A, which is a short version, 1040EZ, which is a really short version, 1040NR that is filed by non-resident aliens, and 1040NREZ, uh, which is a shorter version of the 1040NR, and finally, 1040PR, which is a US self-employment tax return filed by bona fide residents of Puerto Rico. I also wanted to point out here that if you have income from American Samoa, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, Puerto Rico, or the US Virgin Islands, you may have to file a tax return with the tax department of that possession. Or you may have to file two annual returns, one with the possession's tax department and the other with the Internal Revenue Service. Form 1040, you may use the IRS Form 1040 for nearly all taxpayers. Form 1040 is the most complex of the three resident IRS forms. Form 1040 can be used to report all sources of income, deductions, and credits. Form 1040A is a simpler form to complete than 1040. However, this form has restrictions on the types of income, credits, and deductions that can be reported on it. For example, you can report income from wages, pensions, interest, dividends, and unemployment, but you cannot report income from stock sales, self-employment, or rental property. 1040A also cannot be used by all taxpayers. You should take time to interview a client to determine if they even qualify for the form. Form 1040EZ is the simplest of all the forms. IRS created it so that uh, filers without complex tax situations could have a one-page form to fill out and send in. But the form is so simple, it creates problems in and of itself. And that is that it provides space for only two filing statuses, single and married filing joint. 
but also it only provides space for essentially three types of income, unemployment, wages, and interest. And if you don't have one of those three types of income, or if you have an income above and beyond those three, then you can't fill out the form. And I have observed that people who file 1040EZ frequently fill it out and leave off income that is required to be reported. And the reason they left it off is there's no line for it. For example, pension income. You might have a 1099R showing you had pension income. 1040EZ doesn't provide a line for pension income. And so the person thinks, oh, well, I guess I don't need to report that income. Or they'll put pension income on line 7 as wage income where it doesn't belong. The next form to talk about is 1040NR. 1040NR is filed by people who are not residents of the United States um, or citizens of the United States. You must file 1040NR if you do not meet the residency requirements for filing a U.S. resident return, but you had taxable income from the United States. Important facts you should know about Form 1040NR are you may be required to file Form 1040NR if you are not a U.S. citizen and you resided in the United States for less than 183 days during the year. If you are required to file Form 1040NR, you will not be allowed to claim the standard deduction. You must itemize your deductions instead. That is, unless you are a student or a business apprentice from India. If you are required to file Form 1040NR, you cannot file a joint return with your spouse, unless, of course, you are a resident of India. The United States has signed tax treaties with many different countries. And if you are a resident of a foreign country living or working in the United States, you may be affected by a tax treaty between the United States and your home country. Tax treaties between the United States and other countries are outlined in IRS Publication 901, U.S. Tax Treaties. And I did want to show you that publication real quick. Um, Non-resident returns are really a more advanced aspect of tax law. But the thing is, you never know exactly when you are going to have a non-resident of the United States come and sit down in your tax office and want to get a tax return prepared. And uh, so if you have that type of situation, even as a first-year preparer, you should be able to recognize that you do have a client in front of you who requires a specialized filing. And maybe you need to refer that client to, on to a, a person with more experience within your firm or to a firm that can handle it. But Form 901, or pardon me, Publication 901, uh, provides an abbreviation or a condensation of all of the different tax treaties that the United States has with other countries. And if you scroll through, you'll see that it's arranged alphabetically by country, starting with Australia, moving on to Austria, Bangladesh, and so forth. And so if you have a person uh, sitting with you uh, who's come to get their tax return prepared, and you establish that they are not a resident of the United States, and that they possibly could be filing as a non-resident on Form 1040NR, you should refer to Publication 901 to see the tax treatments that may apply to them that are specialized. If a person is required to file ten Form 1040NR, um, they would be filing this particular form right here. And this is a five-page form with the first two pages looking fairly much like 1040. But then we have uh, page three, which has a Schedule A for itemizing deductions, because most non-residents are not allowed to item, uh, allowed the standard deduction. They're forced to itemize. Then we have a breakdown of income that is not effectively connected with the U.S. trade or business. And then finally, on the fifth page, they get into descriptions about the type of uh, a visa you have for being in the United States, whether or not you hold a green card, what uh, country you're a national of, um, and whether or not you're taking advantage of any tax treaties. So let's move back into our manual now. And we're going to move on to point number five. So point number four was that the US has tax treaties with foreign countries. And if you are filing Form 1040NR, you need to look up the tax treaties to see if they apply to you. Even if you were inside of the United States for more than 183 days, you may still be required to file Form 1040NR if you are a student who is generally holding a J-1 visa, in certain situations an F-1 visa or a teacher holding a J-1 visa, or a researcher, or a temporary worker generally holding an H-1 visa, if you are specifically affected by a tax treaty between the United States and your home country. If you believe you may be required to file as a non-resident, you should refer to IRS Publication 519 for more information. So just a moment ago, I showed you Publication 901, which is U.S. tax treaties. Publication 519 is another publication, again, that talks about filing instructions and requirements and rules that affect individuals who are filing Form 1040 NR. 
Form 1040 NR EZ is a simpler form to file than 1040 NR, and again, you should refer to IRS Publication 17 for more information about using this form and who might qualify for it. Form 1040 PR, self-employed persons, including farming in Puerto Rico, uh, use Form 1040 PR Spanish language to compute self-employment tax. The Social Security Administration uses the information from this form to figure benefits under the Social Security Program. Form 1040 SS is the English language equivalent of Form 1040 PR. And you should refer to IRS Publication 570 for more information about Puerto Rican returns. Next up is dual status taxpayer. A dual status taxpayer is an individual who was a non-resident of the United States for part of the year and a resident of the United States for the other part of the year. As a dual status resident, you will prepare and file Form 1040 NR for the part of the year that you were a non-resident, and you will file Form 1040 for the part of the year that you were a resident of the United States. Now there is a special rule called a first year election for a non-resident to be treated as a full year resident of the United States. In certain situations, it may be beneficial for a first-year election to be treated as a U.S. resident alien for the year, or a U.S. resident for the year. Whether you will benefit under this election will depend on the specifics of your tax situation. For example, if you are married and brought your spouse and your children with you, you may wish to elect to file as a full-year resident because you will be allowed to use the married filing joint status and to claim certain tax credits that are not available to Form 1040 NR filers. On the other hand, if you are single and had high income outside of the United States prior to arriving in the United States, you may not benefit from making a first-year election that would require you to pay U.S. tax on your worldwide income. Okay, at this point, I'm actually going to give you a password because I did promise in the introductory video that I would be giving you three passwords in every class. And actually, the first, I did give you a password in the introductory video, and I'm going to give it to you a second time here. The first password of the day is not associated with a test, and it is silver. So at this point, if you have not already written down the word silver from having watched the introductory video, you should do so now. And uh, silver is going to be the first password that you need to make note of for the password test. And with that, I'm going to stop this uh, manual showing for the moment, and I'm going to pull up 1040 EZ. Now 1040 EZ is uh, essentially a one-page form. The IRS designed this form to make it simple as possible, essentially for young single people to file the returns, or not necessarily even young people, uh, just people who are earning less than, say, $50,000 a year and are single to file. Um, a few years ago, they increased the filing income to $100,000. It's possible to file 1040 easy when your income is, I believe, up to $100,000 now. Um, but at any rate, uh, to use the form, you have to have a filing status of only single or married filing joint. Any other filing status, you cannot use this form. It then provides space to enter wage income, interest, unemployment, and Alaska Permanent Dividend Funds. If you have any other form of income, you cannot use the form. Uh, it does provide space for the making work pay credit and the earned income credit that is attributable to a person who is meeting the requirements for EIC, but not because they have a qualifying child. And that's it. Um, you'll notice that page two of uh, 1040EZ is just a worksheet. And this worksheet is used to figure the standard deduction for a dependent. There's also a second worksheet for determining what your making work pay credit is. But this worksheet is not filed with the return. It's just really instructions on how to determine how much your standard deduction will be if you are a dependent. And we're actually going get, to get into those instructions uh, a little bit later in today's class. The next form I'm going to show you is 1040A. 1040A truly is a two-page form. If you want to know the instructions for 1040A, you actually have to go to the instruction booklet for 1040A. It has a few pages of instructions. And uh, you'll see that 1040A has a big difference from 1040EZ straight off the bat, and that is that it has space for all five filing statuses. And we're going to talk about filing statuses in session two. Um, under exemptions, you'll see it provides space for dependents. And then it has space for wages, interest, dividend, capital gain distributions, IRA distributions, pensions and annuities, 
unemployment, and Social Security. It also offers a small number of adjustment items, including educator expenses, the IRA deduction, the student loan interest deduction, and the tuition and fees deduction. On page two, it provides space for the standard deduction. You cannot itemize if you file 1040A. Um, and then it has space for exemption deductions, figuring your tax, and then figuring credits. Credits that can be claimed on this form include the credit for child and dependent care expenses, the credit for the elderly or disabled, education credits, the retirement savings contribution credit, and the child tax credit. There's also space down here for the making work pay credit and the earned income credit. But if you are eligible for any other forms of deductions or credits, you cannot use Form 1040-EZ. Next, I'm going to pull up Form 1040, the long form. And from this point forward in the course, I'm never going to spend time worrying about or referring to um, IRS form short forms. I'm always going to be referring to the long form. So that's something just to get used to, that if I refer to a particular line number on Form 1040, I'm talking about the long form. Um, so anytime you're doing a homework assignment or a classwork assignment, please remember to fill out the long form version of the form rather than the short form version. Because if you fill out the short form version, your line numbers will not match up with mine. Um, but let's take a look at what makes Form 1040 special. Beginning with, uh, at the top, of course, it does provide space for all five filing statuses and dependents. So the very top of the form is identical to 1040A. But when we get into the income section, there's a lot more lines. Now we have, in addition to all of the lines that you saw on the 1040A, we also have a line for entering taxable refunds, alimony, business income, capital gains or losses, other gains or losses, rental, real estate, royalties, partnerships, S-corporations, and trusts, farm income, and something else down here on line 21 called other income. Under adjusted gross income, we have many more adjustments, including on line 24, certain business expenses of reservists, performing artists, and fee basis government officials, health savings accounts, moving expenses, one half of the self-employment tax, self-employed SEP simple and qualified plan contributions, self-employed health insurance deduction, penalty on early withdrawal of savings, alimony. Um, you'll see that there are some other items in here like uh, IRA deduction, student loan interest, and tuition fees that are a match to what you see on the 1040A. And then we move down to line 35 where we have space for a deduction called the Domestic Production Activities Deduction. And we'll actually touch on that topic uh, when we get to self-employment. But throughout our course, we're going to spend each session focusing on one or two, sometimes three or four lines of the Form 1040 and the accompanying schedules. For example, uh, in uh, coming up quick, I think by session three, actually, we're going to be talking about wages and interest and dividends all in one session. So we'll probably spend one session covering about three lines of the form. Um, we'll also get in another session where we're talking about taxable refunds, alimony, and a variety of other things in a single session. But in other sessions, we might spend the entire class talking just about one line. For example, when we get to rental income, we'll spend an entire session just talking about rental income. We will devote an entire session talking to adjustments to income, where we will it's quite a detailed session with a lot of material because there are so many adjustments. Then on page two, there's an option to either claim the standard deduction or to itemize your deductions. And today in our class, session one, we will talk about the standard deduction, but we will not get to itemize deductions until about session eight. Then there's a line for exemptions, figuring your taxable income. But unlike 1040A and EZ, uh, there's more places to calculate your tax than just on line 43 um, and line 44. You'll see that line 45 provides additional space for something called the alternative minimum tax. And then down here, we also have space for other taxes, including self-employment tax, um, unreported Social Security and Medicare tax on forms 4137, 4137 or 8919, additional tax on IRAs and other qualified retirement plans. Um, line 59 provides more space for three additional taxes. Then up here under credits, we have space for more credits, including the foreign tax credit, um, the retirement savings contribution credit, residential energy credits, and then a whole list of other credits that are so long they actually ran out of space and they just leave you a spot to hand write in the uh, credit that you're claiming. Down at the bottom under payments, we have 
the same Making Work Pay credit and Earned Income credit, but we also have additional Child Tax Credit, American Opportunity Credit, First Time Home Buyer Credit, Excess Social Security and Railroad uh, Retirement Tax withheld, Credit for Federal Tax on Fuels, and a variety of other credits that have check boxes. So that's basically an overview of Form 1040. And in today's class, we're going to have a lecture about who is even required to file this return. And if you are required to file and don't file it, what kind of penalties do you have to pay? And uh, then in session two, we're going to look into which box I check up here and who I can claim as a dependent here. But for today, we're really going to be focusing on just a very overall broad view of filing requirements. So going back to the manual. One of the things that you have to have when you file a return is an identification number. And for most individuals, that identification number is our Social Security number. But not everyone is eligible for a Social Security number. So if you are not eligible for a Social Security number, you may need to apply for an identification number issued by the IRS, which is called a TIN. Individuals who file a U.S. tax return have to enter their Social Security number or a TIN on the return. A TIN is issued by the IRS to individuals who are not eligible for a Social Security number. Like a Social Security number, nine digit, the uh, ITIN or TIN number is nine digits long. So on paper, when it's written out or when it's filled in on a tax form, it looks like it's a Social Security number. There's really no way to tell that it's not a Social Security number, except for the fact that all ITINs begin with the digit nine. So if you do see a, a Social Security number and the first number in that number is a nine, or the first digit is a nine, that would tell you it's probably an ITIN. Now an ITIN is an individual taxpayer identification number that is issued by the Internal Revenue Service to individuals who are required to have a U.S. tax ID number, but do not have and are not eligible to get a Social Security number. However, taxpayers who file using ITINs are not eligible for certain tax credits. A W-7 is used to request an ITIN. Do not complete Form W-7 if you have a Social Security number or you are eligible to get a Social Security number. In 2010, the IRS started to issue an ITIN assignment letter in place of an ITIN card. And the ITIN card really didn't look much like a card. It was actually, it came on a letter and then you peeled this uh, rectangular shape off and you folded it in half and when you were done you had something that kind of looked like a card. But in no way would I have ever believed it could be confused with a Social Security card, but apparently people were claiming they were confused. And so the IRS now does not issue anything that can even look like a card when it's folded together. Now they're issuing a letter only. All new ITIN applicants must now also show a federal tax purpose for seeking an ITIN. So with some exceptions, this means that the IRS requires the application for an ITIN, including identification verifying identity, be attached to the tax return that is being mailed in. As we sit right now, a passport is the only standalone document that will prove identity and foreign status to the IRS. If you are filing Form W-7 and you do not have a passport, then you must attach two other forms of identification. One would identify you as a person, and the other one would show that you are not a resident of the United States who is eligible for a Social Security card. Okay, and A-10 is an, an adoption taxpayer identification number issued by the Internal Revenue Service as a temporary taxpayer identification number for a child who has been adopted domestically within the United States. And uh, essentially, you get that number while you're waiting to get a real Social Security number for that child. Um, here is the Form W-7, and again, this form is filled out by people who are not eligible to get Social Security numbers and are applying for a number that will be included on the tax return. It could be the tax filer, him or herself, needs the ITIN for filing their personal return. It could also be the case that they are claiming, you could have a U.S. resident who's very legitimate who is claiming a dependent, say, in Canada or Mexico. And that dependent uh, can be claimed for tax purposes but is not eligible for a Social Security number. So if you find that you're in a situation where you think your client needs a ITIN number, either for themselves or their spouse or a dependent, Form W-7 needs to be attached to the return. It gets mailed to a very specific address with the IRS. And to the return, you attach Form W-7 and uh, appropriate identification that has been notarized. 
There's quite a few pages of very specific instructions that go with W7, so I suggest you do not attempt to fill the form out without reading the instructions as you go, because if you fail to follow the instructions exactly, the IRS will not uh, grant the number. And in fact, even when you do everything perfectly, the odds of the IRS dropping the ball and losing a page or sending all the paperwork back or losing the work entirely is very high. So W7s are never an easy form to file because they do go paper, they do have documentation that gets attached, and the IRS regularly loses that documentation. Next up is how to file. So you've prepared the return, and now you need to file it. Well, how do you go about filing? Well, individual taxpayers who fill out their own taxes can file them by mail or they can file them electronically. But if you are a tax professional, the IRS requires you to file electronically. The e-file requirement for paid tax preparers is being phased in over two years, and the first phase started in 2011. So as we're sitting right now, we are required to file all tax returns electronically if our firm does 100 or more in a single tax, tax season. And for 2012, that number drops to just 11. So if you as an individual self-employed tax preparer do 11 or more returns in a tax season, or if you work for a firm that does 11 or more tax returns in a season, you are required to file electronically beginning in 2012. Um, getting electronic filing permission is actually a fairly rigorous process. You have to get fingerprint checks. You have to submit tax uh, or basically go through screening checks with the IRS. And not everybody is going to be eligible to be an ERO. So there's going to be, I think, a number of people in the industry who are being pushed out who have not uh, been forced to electronically file in the past and are now being forced to e-file but are not eligible to be electronic return originators maybe because of shady pasts. Um, so we're going to be seeing some changes as a result of that e-file rule. Now, the new e-file rule, though, does not apply to individuals who do not meet the definition of tax return preparers under the Internal Revenue Code and related regulations, such as an individual who provides tax assistance under a volunteer income tax assistance or VITA program is not required to e-file. A person who merely prepares the return of his or her employer also is not required to e-file. And a person who prepares a return as a fiduciary is not required to e-file. Now, when you do electronically file, there is a form that has to be be completed and signed by the tax preparer and by the taxpayer. Paid preparers who file returns electronically for their clients are required to file Form 8879 with the return. Form 8879 is the declaration document and signature authorization form for an electronic filed return. It is signed by the taxpayer, signed by the spouse if there is a spouse on a joint return, and then it is also signed by the ERO. The electronic return originator is usually the same person as the tax preparer. So at the time you prepare the return, you have the client sign it, and then you as the paid preparer also sign it. And then at that point, you have permission to send that return electronically from the client. Now, in certain situations, e-file may not necessarily be uh, fully possible. There are some situations where you might have a form that simply cannot go electronically. Or it could be that the tax form has attachments that are so long that they can't go out electronically. When that happens, the IRS wants you to go ahead and file 80, the, the main body of the form electronically and then mail in those paper attachments to IRS with a form called 8453. And if you have any more questions about form 8453 and paper attachments, you should refer to page 17, or pardon me, page 19 of publication 17. And this is form 8879 right here, pretty basic form. It provides space for the taxpayer name, the spouse name, social security numbers, five different lines to enter income and uh, tax information from the tax return. You would essentially look to specific line numbers on the Form 1040 and then copy them over. Then it provides space for the taxpayer to sign, space for the spouse to sign, and space for the ERO. Usually, that is the tax preparer to sign. Filing deadlines. April 15th is the deadline for timely filing of a U.S. tax return. Should April 15th fall on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, the filing deadline is delayed until the next business day. So if April 15th falls on a Sunday, then the filing deadline for that year will be Monday the 16th. 
filing, the filing deadline for 2010, for example, fell onto Monday, April 18th. And that was because Friday, April 15th, was a legal holiday, Emancipation Day, in the District of Columbia. Extensions. It is common belief that you should file for an extension if you cannot afford to pay your tax by the due date of your return. The reality is that if you owe money and cannot afford to pay it, you should file your return on time and worry about how you will pay the money later. So how do you request an extension of time to file? Well, you do it by filing Form 4868. And 4868 gives you an automatic additional six months to get your return filed on time. Now, it's a common belief, as I already said, that if you can't afford to pay, then you should just file an extension to give yourself more time to pay. But unfortunately, an extension of time to file is not an extension of time to pay. And that is why Form 4868 actually has space to figure and tell the IRS what you think your balance due will be. And I'll just kind of zoom in on this extension form a little so you can see what I'm talking about. If we scroll here, we'll see that on line 6 it says total balance due. And you're supposed to mail that balance due with the extension. So uh, really, filing an extension of time to file does not give you more time to pay. And when you send in your extension, you should send what you owe with it. Now, there is an automatic extension for certain ta people who are overseas. The filing deadline for most taxpayers is April 15th. However, if April 15th falls on a weekend, then the deadline moves to the next business day. And then in the cases of individuals who are either outside of the United States or serving in a combat zone, you may have additional time on top of April 15th. So firstly, individuals who are outside of the United States. You are allowed an automatic two-month extension until June 15 if you are a US citizen or resident. And on April 15th, you are living outside of the US and Puerto Rico. And your main place of business is outside of the United States or Puerto Rico. Or you are in the military or naval service on duty outside of the US and Puerto Rico. To get an automatic extension because you are outside of the United States, you must attach a written statement to your return explaining which reason above, A or B, qualifies you for the extension. You should still pay any tax you owe by April 15th, or you will be charged interest, but not a penalty, from the date that the tax is owed but not paid. Individuals serving in combat zones get some special treatment. The deadline for filing your tax return and paying any tax you owe and filing a claim for a refund is automatically extended if you serve in a combat zone. You are considered to be serving in a combat zone if you are a member of the Armed Forces, the Red Cross, an accredited correspondent, or a civilian under the direction of the Armed Forces, and you were serving in the Persian Gulf area, effective January 17, 1991, or the Qualified Hazardous Duty Area of Yugoslavia, Serbia, Montenegro, Albania, and the Adriatic Sea, and the Ionian Sea north of the 39th parallel after March 24, 1991, pardon, 1999, or Afghanistan, effective September 19, 2001. Extension period. The deadline for filing your return, paying any tax due, and filing a claim for a refund is extended for at least 180 days after the later of the last day you served in a combat zone or the last day you were confined to a hospital for injury from service in a combat zone. Your extension period includes at least 180 days plus an additional amount of time equal to the amount of time you had left to file your return prior to April 15 before you entered the combat zone, up to three and a half months if you entered the combat zone on January 1st. So what this is essentially saying is if you are a military and you're serving in a combat zone, you look at what point of the year it was when you entered that combat zone. And if you entered the combat zone, say, in the middle of tax season, well, you would have, you're, you're given automatically the additional amount of time that you would have had had you not been uh, leaving the country. And then on top of that, you have 180 days. And the unique thing about uh, military personnel serving in combat zones is the extension is just not extension of time to file. It is also extension of time to pay tax without penalty or interest accruing. And if you have a refund coming, it actually gives you more time to file for a refund as well. Penalties and interest for late filing. Now, an extension of time to file, as I've already said, is not an extension of time to pay. You should estimate how much money you think you will owe when you file your return, and then mail your balance due in with your extension. The IRS will charge you penalties and interest if you do not pay your balance due with your extension. 
Late filing and late payment penalties are assessed on unpaid taxes owed with the return, and the due date for taxes is always the original filing deadline for the return, usually April 15. Now, there's the first rule is about filing late and the penalty associated with late filing. A failure to file penalty is assessed when your tax return is filed after the due date plus extensions, uh, and the usual penalty is 5% for each month or a part of a month that a return is late, but not more than 25%. So let's, let's see what we mean by that. Let's just suppose that your tax return was due on April 15th, and on that return you owed $1,000, but you didn't pay it. Okay? So what is the penalty? Well, the, pay, the penalty is going to be 5% or $50 per month. 2000 yeah, $50 per month. I'm never sure with numbers, so I always like to double check. So $50 a month. And if you're five months late, then that penalty could go up as high as um, 25%. So 25% of $1,000 would be $250 potentially late filing penalty for filing late. So not only do you owe the $1,000, you also owe this $250 penalty for filing late. Now, if your return is more than 60 days late, the penalty cannot be smaller than $135 or 100% of the unpaid tax. So in this case, 100% of the unpaid tax would be $1,000. Uh, so that means the minimum penalty would be 135 But by the time you're um, five months late, you're at $250. But if you're only 60 days late, that would be like $100. But the punishment would be a minimum of $135. Fraud. If your failure to file is due to fraud, the late payment penalty is 15% for each month or part of each month that your return is late. The maximum failure to file penalty is 75%. So on a tax return with balance due of $1,000, that would put the uh, penalty for fraud at $750. And other penalties would be assessed on top of that as well. Late payment facts. A failure to pay penalty of one half of 1% is assessed for each month or a part of months after the due date that the tax is not paid. So this late payment penalty is different than the filing penalty. You'll see that the filing penalty is 5% a month, and that's pretty severe. Less severe is the failure to pay penalty. That's why I say if you can't afford to pay on time, at least file on time, because by filing on time you avoid this 5% per month penalty and half of a percent per month is a smaller penalty. But if you both file late and pay late, then you owe both penalties. You are not required to pay this penalty if you filed for an extension and paid at least 90% of your actual tax liability on or before the due date of your return, and then pay the balance due when you finally file. So what does that mean? Well, let's just suppose you owe $1,000 with your return but you file for an extension because you don't have all the information you need. And when you file the extension, you estimate that you think you're going to owe about $1,000, and so you send in $900 with the extension. Since $900 is within 90% of $1,000, you actually won't owe any interest on that $100 still owing. So if you get within 90% of $1,000, or 90% of what you think you're going to owe when you file, then the IRS says you won't have to actually pay that late payment penalty of a half percent per month as long as you file within the time frame of your filing deadline and pay the tax with uh, the return when you actually file it. That means you pay the $100 that you owe. The monthly rate of the failure to pay, pen pay penalty is half the usual rate, 0.25% instead of a half percent, if an installment agreement is in effect for that month. You must have filed your return by the due date, including extensions, to qualify for this reduced penalty. If a notice of intent to levy is issued, the rate of interest will increase to 1% at the start of the first month, beginning at least 10 days after the date that the notice was issued. If a notice and demand for immediate payment is issued, the rate will increase to 1% at the start of the first month, beginning after the day that the notice and demand is issued. This penalty cannot be more than 25% of your unpaid tax, and you will not have to pay the penalty if you can show that you had good reason for not paying your tax on time. Combined penalties. If you file and pay late, your failure to file penalty of 5% or 15% is reduced by the failure to pay penalty. However, if you file your return more than 60 days after the due date, including extensions, 
the penalty is a smaller of $135 or 100% of the unpaid tax. Interest on tax owed, the IRS assesses interest on any balance owed until it is paid in full. So essentially you have late payment penalties, you have failure to file penalties, and then you have interest on top of all of that. So the penalties for filing late, paying late, can add up to be very significant. So this seems to me to be a good point to give you a second password of the day. So grab your pen and write it down. The second password of the day is also not associated with a test. And that password is Scout. So if you're a Lone Ranger fan, you would know that Silver was the name of the Lone Ranger's horse, and Scout was the name of Tonto's horse. So there is your second password of the day. All right, the next topic of the day is who must file a tax return. You must file a federal tax return if you are a citizen or resident of the United States or a resident of Puerto Rico, and you meet the following requirements outlined in Tables 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3 of IRS Publication 17. These tables are so important, we just copied them out of Pub 17 and put them right into our manual. So in reading Pub 17, you will be able to find these in Chapter 1. And let's start with Table 1, 1. And the way it works with the IRS is the first thing you do is establish your marital status. Your marital status is the base point for determining your filing status. So for example, if you are not married, or if you are divorced, then you are single. And you can file as single. In certain situations, a person who is single will file as head of household as well. And uh, if head of household is a status that you're eligible for, it can uh, cause you to pay less tax. We're not going to get into the requirements for head of household today. Those will happen in session two. But which filing status you file under does affect your filing requirement. And let's carry over here and look at age next. Because age is relevant to filing requirement. And the reason for that is, is that if you turn age 65, you're actually allowed to have more income before you were allowed to file. So the filing requirement for a person who is under age 65 and who is single is $9,350. And the filing requirement for someone who is age 65 and single is $10,750. What is the difference between those two numbers? Well, the difference between those two numbers is $1,400. So 93, actually, go, let's go 10,750 minus 9350 is $1,400. So there is a $1,400 difference in the filing requirement for a person who is under age uh, 65 and someone who is age 65 or older. So that's the difference in the number. Um, but let's just see what makes the number to begin with, huh? So the filing requirement for a single person who is under age 65 is 9350. Is that a number you need to know? Well, yeah. I don't know if IRS on its uh, national exam is going to ask you to have that number memorized or not. And many students who come to our course start wondering, do I have to memorize all of these numbers? And the answer is, uh, possibly. We don't really know how IRS is going to test. Certainly, the Oregon Tax Board on its tests expects these numbers to be relevant and does include numbers like this in the exam. Um, so how do you go about learning these numbers? Well, I say that the methodology behind how the numbers are calculated is the more important thing to know. And if you understand how the numbers are calculated, then you don't have to memorize the numbers because you can just figure them for yourself. This is something I would refer to as critical thinking over sheer rote memorization, that you understand the basis of where a number comes from so that you can calculate it. So let's take a look at 9350 and where that number comes from. Well, it comes from two places. One is the standard deduction, and the other is the personal exemption. Now, your standard deduction varies according to your filing status. But for a single person, that standard deduction is $5,700. Okay? And if you're married, your standard deduction is twice that of single. So then it would be 10,400 if you're married, filing a joint return. All right? So that may, that's pretty easy. We need to know 5,700. That's a baseline number that we really have to me have memorized. Another number to have in the back of your head is the uh, standard deduction for head of household. And that is $8,400. Okay? So those are really the three numbers that you need to have memorized with regards to standard deduction. And here's why. The standard deduction for single and married filing separate is $5,700. Married filing joint is twice that of single. And head of household stands out on its own as $8,400.
So what that really means is you just need to memorize 8400 and 5700 and you're there. There is one other number of import and that is the personal exemption deduction. And the personal exemption deduction is $3,650. So that is another number that you need to know. The beauty of the exemption deduction is it's the same for every filer. Every filer has an exemption deduction of $3,650. And I touched my forehead because essentially if you think of every person walking and breathing and living in the United States today, under the tax code every single person has $3,650 stamped on their forehead. That is what the deduction is for a person on a tax return. If you are filing and claiming your own exemption, you get that deduction for yourself. And if you're filing and claiming a dependent, then you get to claim that $3,650 deduction for your dependent as well. So how does that figure into filing requirement? Well, what happens when you take $9,350 and subtract out $3,650? Well, you get $5,700. Or another way to look at it is that $5,700 plus $3,650 is the filing requirement for a single person. And if that single person is age 65 or older, you can add $1,400, and that's where $10,750 comes from. Now let's move over here where it says head of household. What is the filing requirement for head of household? Well, you take the standard deduction of $8,400, add $3,650 to it, and what do you get? $12,050. So that's pretty simple. And then if you're head of household and age 65 or older, you add $1,400 and you're up to $13,450. Now if you were married with a child and lived apart from your spouse during the last six months of the year, you could qualify for head of household and you've got these same two numbers repeating that we just saw right here. Moving down to married and living with your spouse at the end of the year and filing a joint return, your filing requirement is $18,700. Well, where does that come from? Well, it's double this number, isn't it? 9,350, that would be 5,700 plus 3,650. And when you're filing a joint return, both you and your spouse each get those numbers, and that's where 18,700 comes from. Now what about this number? This number is $1,100 higher than the one on top. So essentially if you take $19,800 and subtract out $18,700, you get $1,100. Okay, now when you are single and over age 65, your additional deduction is $1,400. But when you are married, that additional deduction is only $1,100. So the where 19800 comes from is you, if you have one spouse who is age 65 or older, then you add an $1,100 amount to the standard deduction. So just as a recap, how do we figure the filing requirement for a person who is married and both spouses are under age 65? You're going to go 5700 plus 5700 plus 3650 plus 3650 equals $18,700. Now what's this? Married separate. Any age, the filing requirement is 3650. Well, why is that? Well, it happens to be the case that if you are married filing separately, if your spouse itemizes deductions on his or her return, then you are required to itemize and you are not allowed a standard deduction. If you're not allowed a standard deduction, you're not allowed this number right here. And if you're not allowed this number, then you're left with only the exemption deduction that you would be allowed to claim. And that is why if your income exceeds the exemption deduction, then you are required to file a return. Now, married and not living with your spouse at the end of the year, whether you file joint or separate, the filing requirement moves to 3650. And then finally at the bottom we have another status called widowed before 2010 and not remarried during the year. We can see for a single person that uh, that filing requirement is the same as it is up here. And for head of household, it matches head of household right here. But what about this? Qualifying widow with dependent child under age 65, where did that 15,000 come from? Well, this one's a little bit tricky, but let's do the logic behind it because it doesn't make sense when you figure it out. The way we figure that out is remember that the filing requirement for single is $5,700. And then assuming you were married, you'd get another $5,700 for your spouse. Um, and you also get the $3,650 for yourself. And on a married filing joint return, you'd get $3,650 twice. But on a qualifying widow with dependent child, you're only getting $3,650 once. And that's where the $15,050 comes from. And then, of course, if you are a qualifying widow who is age 65 or older, then you would get an additional $1,100 
of standard deduction, which is where we have 16,150. You would take 15,050 uh, and add to that 1,100, and that gives you $16,150. So those are just some little secrets for you about where these filing requirements come from. I did want to point out that the filing requirement for an individual happens when your income reaches this number. So if your income is 9350, then you are required to file. If your income is 9300 and 49 dollars, you are not required to file a return. Table 1 2. This has to do with filing requirements for dependents. If your parents or someone else can claim you as a dependent and any of the situations below applies to you, you must file a tax return. In this table, earned income includes salaries, wages, tips, and professional fees. It also includes taxable scholarship and fellowships and grants. And you should refer to Publication 17, Chapter 12, page 93 to read more about the taxability of certain scholarships and fellowships. Unearned income includes investment type income such as taxable interest, ordinary dividends, and capital gain distributions. It also includes unemployment compensation, taxable social security benefits, pensions, annuities, and distributions of, earned, of unearned income from a trust. Gross income is the total of your earned and unearned income. Single dependents, were you age 65 or older or blind? If the answer is no, you must file a tax return if any of the following apply. Your unearned income was more than $950. Your earned income was more than $5,700. Or your gross income was more than the larger of $950 or your earned income up to $5,400 plus $300. So if you're shaking your head going, well, what does all that mean? Let's do a whiteboard together and think about it a little. All right. So. We've got a, a dependent. Let's just say their name is um, Jackie. Okay? And Jackie is age 16. She got a job. She is a dependent of her parents. And the amount of income that Jackie earned in the year working her job was $2,400. So that's the first piece of information that we have for our dependent. The second piece of information is that Jackie has unearned income. And how much earned income shall we give her? Let's just say she had $350 of earned income. The question that you have to ask yourself is, does Jackie meet the filing requirements? Well, let's go over and take a look at this table here. The table says that she's required to file if her unearned income is more than $950. Well, her unearned income in this illustration is $350, isn't it? So she doesn't meet that number. And then it says your earned income was more than $5,700. Well, her earned income is only 2400 so she doesn't pass that number. But then we get to the third rule. Your gross income was more than the larger of 950 or your earned income up to 5400 plus $300. So where are we here? Well, her earned income is $2,400. If we add $300 um, for the under-earned income component, did she earn more than that? The answer is, yes, she did. She earned 350 of under-earned income. So in this situation, Jackie is required to file a tax return. Then we move on to the next rule in this slide, which has to do with a person who is a dependent, but is either age 65 or older or is blind. And if that's the case, you get an additional amount that is added to your filing requirement. And that additional amount is usually $1,400. So if you're age 65 or older, your additional standard deduction is $1,400. And that $1,400 can be added to the unearned income category. So if your unearned income was more than $2,350, um, you are required to file a return if you're age 65 or older or blind. But if you are both 65 or older and blind, then you get 1400 twice. That would carry you from 19, 950 all the way up to 3750. And then, of course, we have the same test here that you also have the earned income test. And in both the unearned income and the earned income test, we're able to add that $1,400 number in. But when we go down to the third test, it says, your gross income was more than the larger of either $2,350 or your earned income up to $5,400 plus $1,700. So the $1,700 would be $300 plus $1,400. So that's the filing requirements for dependents. And then on Table 1-3, other situations when you must file a 2010 tax return. So even if you don't meet the requirements to file based on numbers you've calculated on uh, Table 1 or numbers that you calculated on Table 2, you're not required to file according to those tables. You still have to pass 
through table number three and meet all of the tests. If any of the four conditions listed below apply, you must still file a return. Firstly, you owe any special taxes, including Social Security or Medicare tax on wages you receive from an employer who did not withhold these taxes, or Social Security or Medicare tax on tips that you did not report to your employer, uncollected Social Security, Medicare, or railroad retirement tax on tips you reported to your employer, uncollected Social Security or railroad retirement tax on group term life insurance, the alternative minimum tax, the early withdrawal penalty when you take money out of an IRA or a 401k too soon. There's also the repayment of the first time home buyer credit. Or if you have a household employee, that may cause you to be forced to file a return. Um, item number two says that if you receive the advanced earned income credit, you are required to file. Number three, if you had net income from self-employment of at least $400, then you're required to file. And finally, item number four, if you are a church employee, who earned $108.28 or more, you may be required to file a return as well. So what is the difference between earned and unearned income? You're going to see these two phrases come up continuously throughout our course. IRS is very distinct when it talks about earned income. It's only meaning a very special type of income. And uh, when it comes to filing requirement and refer dependents, for example, where we're looking at the amount of earned income the filer had and the amount of unearned income that that dependent had, that you understand what IRS means by the unearned income and the earned income component. Earned income is money or property you receive for services you perform. Examples include wages, commissions, tips, and farming or other business income. Unearned income includes income from investments such as interest, dividends, rental property, and royalties. It also includes income from unemployment benefits, alimony, pensions, and any other income you receive that is not compensation for performing a service. Now there's another kind of income which is non-taxable income. And non-taxable income is income that is exempt from tax by law. Examples include child support, veterans benefits, various military allowances, including housing allowance, workers' compensation benefits, gifts, life insurance proceeds, and state and municipal bond interest. This is generally federally exempt only, but it could be taxed at the state level and very often is. Okay, we've got room now for a little bit of classwork or group discussion, as I call it in this case. Um, students in our classroom at this point would just be asked to break and work on this quietly along with the instructor. Um, and since uh, we're not really in a classroom situation, I'm just recording a video for you. I'm going to take you through four different illustrations here today. And um, after these illustrations, we're going to wind up this lecture and then give you a classwork assignment, which is really just more of the same. But uh, I wanted to really cover the types of situations where you might see uh, or have to determine whether or not a dependent is required to file. And uh, believe it or not, the filing requirements for dependents seem to be one of the most difficult things for uh, tax preparers to learn. So let's take a look at this first dependent. Jack, age 15, is a dependent. And he had the following sources of income for the year. Wages of 2000 and interest of $350. Is Jack required to file a return? Well, essentially, we have to figure out what is Jack's standard deduction. And the way that the standard deduction works for a dependent is that you take their earned income up to $5,400 and add $300. So his earned income is $2,000. We're going to add $300. And when we're done, we have $2,300. So Jack's standard deduction is going to be $2,300. Well, how much did he earn? Well, he earned $2,350. So is Jack required to file? Yes, he is. So at this point, I recommend you push pause and spend about three, four minutes going through illustrations two, three, and four to determine whether or not those additional situations uh, are required to file. And after you've finished going through illustrations two, three, and four, resume playback of this video, and I'll go over the answers with you. OK, so continuing on with illustration number two. Samantha, age 23, is a full-time student and a dependent. She had the following income for the year. Wages of 600, interest of 350. Is Samantha required to file a return? Well, this one's a little bit tricky, because it's different than the last example completely, isn't it? Let's look at the filing requirement for a dependent. The first rule is, was your unearned income more than 950? Her total income was 950. Her unearned income wasn't more than 950. 
If you take her earned income, it certainly wasn't 5,700. And if you take her total gross income, she's not more than 950, is it? So in illustration number two, the answer is no, not required to file a return. Even though the income is coming from two sources and the unearned form of that income is more than 300, the total income is not more than 950. So Samantha is not required to file. Moving on to illustration number three, Zach is a dependent of his son, John. And Zach had the following income for the year. Wages of 1,200, pension income of 1,600, and interest of 300. Is Zach required to file a return? Well, let's look at Zach's age. What is the filing requirement for a dependent who is age 65? Well, remember, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take the $300 rule, and to that we're going to add $1,400 for being age 65. And that's going to give us $1,700. And the next thing we do is we can add up to $5,400 for wage income. So when we do that, these three numbers equal the largest filing requirement that we could possibly have for a dependent. And does this dependent beat all of these tests up here? Well, let's look at how much income this dependent has. This dependent has wages of 1,200, and that's definitely less than the $5,400 that is allowed for wages. Pension is 1,600, and interest is 300. Well, the combined total of those is the amount of unearned income that Zach has. His total unearned income is actually coming out at $1,900. And that is more than the sum of 300 plus 1,400. So Zach is actually required to file a tax return. And then in illustration number four, Martha, age 20, is a dependent of her parents. She had the following income for the year, wages of 5,200, interest of 300. Is she required to file a return? Well, let's look. Wages of 52 plus 300. Well, 52 is not more than 54, and 300 is not more than the 300 that she's allowed. So the answer is no, Martha, not required to file. And if you want to see uh, the answers in writing, just flip to page 22 of uh, the student manual for session one, and you will see that we have a short answer key. OK, the next topic of the day is the standard deduction. And it was, it's really hard to teach filing requirement without talking about the standard deduction. But we did head on filing requirements first, and now we're going to talk about the standard deduction. Each of the five filing statuses is generally entitled to claim a standard deduction. You can claim your standard deduction instead of itemizing your deductions. You should claim the standard deduction if it is greater than your allowable itemized deductions. Before you figure your standard deduction, you must determine if you are eligible to claim it. You are not allowed to claim a standard deduction and must itemize your deductions if you are married filing a separate return and your spouse itemized his or her deductions. You are filing a tax return for a short tax year because of a change in your annual accounting method. You are a non-resident or dual status alien for the year. You are considered a dual status alien if you were both a non-resident and a resident alien during the year. You are allowed a higher standard deduction if you are age 65 or older. You are considered to be age 65 on the day before your 65th birthday. Therefore, you can take a higher standard deduction for 2010 if your 65th birthday is on or before January 1, 2011. So that's kind of an odd one that you're uh, age 65 the day before your 65th birthday. OK. Also, you are allowed a higher standard deduction if you are blind. You are considered to be blind or partly blind if you cannot see better than 2200 in the better eye with glasses or contact lenses, or your field of vision is not more than 20 degrees. You cannot claim a higher standard deduction for a dependent, only for yourself and your spouse. You are allowed a higher standard deduction for certain net disaster losses or new motor vehicle taxes paid in 2010 for certain vehicles you purchased in 2009 but you must file Schedule L to claim these additional amounts. Your standard deduction is increased by any local state sales tax or excise tax that you paid in 2010 that was imposed upon the first $49,500 of the purchase price of a new vehicle that was purchased after February 16, 2009 and before January 1, 2010. These taxes are deductible in arriving at your adjusted gross income and as such, taxes on a vehicle used in your business cannot be used to increase your standard deduction. 
So what this says is that if you claim the new motor vehicle tax as a deduction on your business, then that deduction has already been claimed, say, on uh, the Schedule C, line 12 of your Form 1040. So if you've already claimed a deduction on line 12 of your 1040, you can't duplicate it a second time. That's what item number one is saying. And item number two, any net disaster loss you had in 2010 because of a disaster that occurred before 2010 and was declared a federal disaster area after 2007. You cannot decrease your standard deduction by any net disaster loss from a disaster that occurred in 2010. So what is the standard deduction? Well, for most filers, the standard deduction is, as I already told you earlier, 5700 for single and 5700 for married filing separate. It is twice that amount for married filing joint or qualifying widow. And then the only other number you have to have memorized is the filing status for head of household, which is $8,400. The additional standard deduction, if you are age 65 or older, or blind, is $1,400 for single and $1,100 for any of the married statuses. This is a form that is used if you are in one of those very rare circumstances where you are able to claim that you paid taxes in 2010 for a purchase that you on a new car in 2009, or if you're one of those specialized casualty loss filers. Other than that, that schedule is not used. Now let's take a look at the standard deduction for dependents. If you can be claimed as a dependent on another person's tax return, your standard deduction is limited to the greater of 950 or your earned income for the year plus $300, but not more than the regular standard deduction amount, which is generally $5,700. Note, however, that if you are age 65 or older or blind, you can add $1,100 or $1,400 based on your meritable status for each of the conditions that you add to the previously computed standard deduction. For example, 950 plus 1100 equals 2050. So if you are a dependent with only unearned income and you are married, then your standard deduction would be 2050 if you are either age 65 or older or blind. But if you ha are a dependent who had earned income, then your standard deduction could be as large as 5700 plus 1100 dollars plus another $1,100 if you were both married and age 65 and blind. So let's take a look at what we mean by that. I'm just going to go over to this uh, illustration that I created just to help us with this lecture a little bit today. And this is an illustration for the calculation of the additional standard deduction for dependents. So if you are unmarried and age 65 or older, the additional standard deduction is $1,400. And if you are unmarried and blind, then the additional standard deduction is $1,400. So if you are both age 65 and blind, then the total additional standard deduction is $2,800. Now, if you are married and age 65 or older, the additional standard deduction is $1,100 rather than $1,400. And if you are married and blind, then the additional standard deduction is also $1,100. So if you are both age 65 and blind, then the additional standard deduction for a married person is $2,200. So an unmarried dependent who is blind has a minimum standard deduction of $2,350. That is $950 plus $1,400. And a married dependent who is blind has a minimum standard deduction of $2,050. That is $950 plus $1,100. So remember that the total standard deduction a dependent can claim is the greater of their minimum standard deduction of $950 or their earned income of up to $5,400 plus $300 plus the additional amount they can claim for being age 65 or older or blind. So here's a couple of examples. Example number one, Jane is a single dependent who is age 40 and blind. She has $2,000 of earned income. What is her standard deduction? Well, her earned income is $2,000, and that is more than $950, so we go with that number. And the earned income? we can add $300, and then we add $1,400 for being blind. Those three numbers add up to $3,700, so that is Jane's standard deduction. Here's another example. Sam is a married dependent who is age 66 and blind. He had $2,000 of pension income and $1,000 of interest income. What is his standard deduction? Well, the point of telling you that he has $2,000 of pension and $1,000 of interest is simply to show that he has no earned income. So he's going to start with a minimum standard deduction of 950, and we then add 1100 for being blind and $1,100 for being age 65 or older because he is uh, married. 
when we add those three numbers up, we get $3,150 as being uh, SAM's standard deduction. So let's take a look again at the definition of earned income versus unearned income. Your earned income is salaries, wages, tips, professional fees, and other amounts you receive as pay for work that you actually perform. Unearned income includes income from investments, pensions, rentals, etc. The next topic we're going to take a look at is calculating tax. And there are two ways that you can go about calculating tax. The first method is actually the most common method for people who calculate tax manually because it is the easier of the two methods. It is to go to the tax tables in Pub 17 and look up the tax that is shown in the table that corresponds to your filing status and taxable income. The second method is to use the tax rate schedules. And if your taxable income is $100,000 or more, you actually have to use the schedules. Um, and those schedules are found on page 267 of Pub 17. Now you will note that when you read Pub 17, it tells you not to use the schedules. However, per for purposes of this course, we do want you to use the schedules to figure you the tax manually. And the reason for that I'll show you right now. So I'm looking in Pub 17 and I'm looking at the tax tables. And if I just scroll to the top here on the tax tables, and I've just randomly picked a page in here, um, in the tax tables, you'll see that the tables are divided into columns with each column representing your filing status. So we have a filing status column for single, a filing status for married filing joint, we have another column for married filing separately, and finally head of household. Now if you recall, there are five filing statuses, but if your filing status is qualifying widow with dependent child, then you use the married filing joint column. The next thing to notice is that it says if line 43, that is your taxable income, is at least this amount but less than this amount, then you'll use the line. So for example, if your taxable income is at least $86,000 but less than $86,050 and you are married filing joint, then the tax would be $13,869. But let's just suppose that your taxable income is $86,050. Well, if it is $86,050, it is not less than $86,050, and so you're going to go down to the next line. And for that same filing status, the tax would, in fact, be $13,881. Now, I wanted to actually show you what we mean by taxable income, because you see right here it says you figure your tax using the amount shown on line 43. Well, we're talking about line 43 of your Form 1040. So let's just pull up the Form 1040 here real quick to see what we mean by that. And I have a Form 1040 in front of you right now. And you'll see that taxable income has a different meaning than income. If we have a filer to whom we give $100,000 of income, that income is greater than the taxable income. The reason for that is that this filer will typically be allowed a standard deduction amount. And in the case of a single person, that's $5,700. And they're also going to be allowed a personal exemption deduction, in this case, $3,650. So if we take 5,700 and subtract that from 100,000, and then we take 3,650 and also subtract that number out, we're actually left with a number on line 43 that is significantly less than the number on line 38. And it is the number on line 43 that we use to calculate the tax. Now if I go to the tax rate tables and look up the tax, we're going to find that the tax is $19,098. So let's go do that together. There we are. And I'm just going to scroll down the page until I find the line for $90,650. And remember that my tax is not less than uh, $90,650. It is $90,650. So I go to the line and I highlight it. So in the tables, I find the line. And I've highlighted for you the line that says $90,650. We observe that the column here is single and the tax on the line is $19,098. Now, is there another way to go about calculating that tax? Or another question might be, where did that tax number come from? How does the IRS come up with that tax? Well, to figure that, we need to go to the tax computation worksheet. But you'll see the worksheet starts at 100000 so we can't really use it, which is why we have you go to the tax rate schedules that are on page 267 of Pub 17. And on the tax rate schedules, what we do is we look for where our income falls on the schedule. 
And if the taxable income is $90,650, then it falls on this column right here because it is more than $82,400 and it is less than $171,850. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that there is a number that appears here, and that number is $16,781.25. And I just want to draw your attention to that number because we're going to use this number to uh, begin the calculation of our tax. That number is the amount of tax on the first $82,400 of income. Our job is now to figure the tax on the income that exceeds that number. So let me pull up a whiteboard where I've done that computation for you. And we start right here in the middle, um, because the top part of this illustration is how to calculate the tax using the tables. And I've just done that for you. We assume income is 100000 That gives us a taxable income of 90650 We then go to Pub 17, page 265, look up the tax. And when we did that, we actually came up with tax of $19,098. So now the next step is, to go to Pub 17 and look up the tax using the tax rate schedules. And to do that, we go to Table X on page 267. We find out where we fall on the income line. We take 90650 subtract $82,400, and then multiply that difference by 28%. And then we add in the number on that line, which was $16,781.25. And the next step is then to take 90650 subtract out $82,400, we get $82,50, we multiply that by 28%, and we get $2,310. We then take that $2,310, we add the $16,781.25, and we get a final number, after all that work, of $19,091.25. How does that compare to the table? Well, the table gave us $19,098 which is $7 more than the tax we calculated manually. So you could say in this illustration that the tax tables are working to our disadvantage. They're giving us a slightly higher tax than we get calculating the tax manually. And you could say that's life. <laughs> um, so be, uh, uh, do pay attention when we're giving you instructions in our course. If we say to calculate the tax um, manually using the tax rate schedules, we're going to be asking you to look for this 19,091 calculation. If we ask you to use the tax tables, we'd be asking you to use the tables, which would give you a slightly different number, sometimes higher, sometimes lower, usually uh, with a difference of between $1 and $7. So we've talked about the tax tables and the tax schedules. Let's talk about accounting methods and periods. You can choose your accounting method when you file your first tax return. If you want to change your accounting method later on, you generally will require IRS approval to do so. The cash method of accounting means you report all income in the year in which you actually or constructively receive it. Most taxpayers are cash basis taxpayers. The accrual method of accounting means you must generally report income when you earn it rather than when you receive it. The accrual method of accounting is generally considered to be more accurate and is the required form of accounting for many kinds of businesses, including retail businesses and businesses that handle inventory. However, the accrual method of accounting is more complex to track. Next, we're on the heading of Form 1040. Begin at the top when completing an individual tax return. And at the top, enter the taxpayer name, social security number, or taxpayer identification number, and the address. You should be very careful to record this basic information accurately, because if you misspell a name or enter a social security number incorrectly, the IRS may reject your return or disallow deductions for you, your spouse, or your dependents. If you put an incorrect address on the return, the IRS will mail your tax refund to the wrong address. Now, as simplistic and obvious as this may seem, I have to tell you that this is an incredibly common problem that many, many tax preparers just don't pay enough attention to what they're entering on the form and, as a consequence, cause misery for their clients. Now, let's just suppose that you've prepared a tax return for a client, and that is showing a $5,000 refund, and you put the wrong address on it. Well, so IRS mails the refund to the wrong address. And by the time that refund actually catches up to that filer at their correct address, two or three months could have passed, all because you didn't get the right address on the form. So we can't emphasize how important that part is. Another part here is getting the correct identification number. And one of the things that goes on is that the IRS 
matches the first four letters of the last name with the social security number on file. So let's just suppose that we have a client whose name is Smith, okay? And the social security number for that filer is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, and so that's that filer's number. And this information needs to be correctly entered on the tax form and saying that the last name, Smith, and the social security number should appear on the tax form like this. But let's just suppose you're not kind of paying attention. And instead of putting Smith on the tax return, you gave this filer a last name of Smythe. And instead of entering the correct last name on the return, you entered this name instead. Well, that's going to cause some problems. Because the IRS is going to be matching the first four letters of the last name with the social security number on the return. And if the taxpayer's last name is actually Smith rather than Smythe, and you put Smythe on the return, then the IRS would reject the tax return as being a mismatch. So as a matter of caution, I always like to see the Social Security card of a client to make sure that there's a match on the last names. And when are there not matches? Well, the most common places that we see a mismatch are when a person marries or divorces. So marriage and divorce can cause a name change. So let's just suppose um, Jackie Jones marries Sam Smith. And uh, when she gets married to Sam, Jackie decides to change her name to Jackie Smith. And she goes and gets a new driver's license and starts telling everyone that her name is now Jackie Smith. Thing is, Jackie doesn't go down to the Social Security office and get a new card. And because Jackie didn't get a new card at the Social Security office, as far as the IRS is concerned, her name is still Jones. And so if she files a tax return with the name Jackie Smith, the tax return will reject. And the only way to get it through would be to file under the name Jackie Jones. Now, if Jackie, Jones doesn't want to, or if Jackie Smith doesn't want to file using the name Jackie Jones, the only way around that problem is to actually go and get a new card. And about 10 days after Jackie receives her new card in the mail, then she would be able to file with IRS and have IRS accept a return with the newly updated name. Another place that we commonly see problems with name mismatches is actually on Spanish um, Latino people. And the reason for that is that um, their social security cards, when they have them, usually have multiple last names. And so you might have a card with a guy, for a guy named Jesus Medina Gonzalez um, Hernandez. Okay? Now, which one of those names is the last name? <laughs> is it Medina? Is it Gonzalez? Is it Hernandez? Uh, it can be hard to tell. And only one of these is going to be the one, na name that matches at IRS. So what are some of the easy ways to tell? Well, I have observed on Social Security cards that usually the way the uh, Social Security Administration will do a card when a person has um, multiple names is that the last name will appear on the second line. If the name is too long to fit on one line, then they'll put it on two lines. And the top line will be the first name uh, and middle name. And the bottom line will be the last name. So if you had a card that looked like this, then uh, you could pretty much establish that the first four letters of the last name would be M-E-D-I-N-A, because that was, that's the name that's appearing on the bottom line. But sometimes you do get a card where the entire name fits on one line, and then how do you know? Well, if there's a hyphen anywhere, for example, let's just suppose that Medina uh, Gonzalez Hernandez has a hyphen between Gonzalez and Hernandez. If there was a hyphen in there, then I would say the, the last name would be Gonzalez. And if there's no hyphen, then I would move over and select Hernandez. Now, let's just suppose no matter how hard you try, you don't get it through correctly, that there's a reject. Well, the beauty with electronic filing is that when a tax return is rejected, you can fix it and resend it. So ultimately, with a person with a name like this, you could basically file them three different ways, one with the last name of Medina, see if it goes through. If it does not, try it with Gonzalez. If it does not go through, try it with Hernandez. <laughs> and uh, one of those methodologies should eventually work for you. Presidential Election Campaign Fund. Both you and your spouse can make an election to have $3 of your tax liability used to help fund the next presidential election campaign. You make the election to have $3 go to the fund by checking the box next to Presidential Election Campaign Fund on the front of the tax return. There's a box to check for the taxpayer and a box to check for the spouse. Now, presidential candidates must meet specific criteria to receive money from this fund. If you elect to designate $3 to the fund, it will not affect the amount of tax you owe or reduce the refund you have coming. In fact, it has no impact on your tax return in any way whatsoever. It's just a matter of did you check the box or not. 
But if you do decide to check the box, you are electing to have $3 diverted towards funding presidential election campaigns for qualified presidential candidates. Candidates eligible to receive money from the presidential election campaign fund must belong to a political party that received 5% of the popular vote in the last presidential election. The Republican, Democratic, and Reform parties all qualified to receive funds during the 2000 presidential campaigns. However, Bush received too much special interest money and was not allowed to receive any funds. Buchanan, Gore, and other candidates did qualify and did receive some funds. Presidential election campaign fund rules. Candidates must promise not to spend more than $50,000 of their own money on their campaign. Recipients of public funds must adhere to a limit on total spending. And according to FEC.gov, primary candidates receive dollar-for-dollar dollar matching up to $250 on contributions. During the general election, Republican and Democratic nominees receive a fixed amount of checkoff dollars. Other political party candidates receive proportionate checkoff amounts if they received at least 5% of the popular vote. Well, how is it that uh, a party other than the Republican or Democratic Party can even get to that point? Well, it did happen. And if you've been around long enough like I have to remember back to when Ross Perot started up the Reform Party in 1992, at that election in 1992, the Reform Party brought in more than 5% of the vote. So in the 1996 campaign, the Reform Party was eligible for money from the fund. And then uh, it repeated 5% of the popular vote in that 1996 campaign and was eligible to draw from the fund again in 2000. Well, in 2000, the Reform Party did not pull in enough votes, and so it could not pull from the fund in the 2004 or later cycles. There was a big hoopla in the 2004 cycle as uh, the Green Party ran under Ralph Nader hoping to pull in enough votes to get that 5%, but it did not succeed in doing so. And so um, the Green Party has never been able to draw from the fund. But that was just kind of a little piece of tidbit news for you. All right, so in 2008, many of the top candidates chose not to accept primary matching funds. The following candidates qualified for and elected to receive funds. Tom Tancredo, I can't say that word, Tancredo. John Edwards, John, uh, Chris Dudd, Joe Biden, Dennis Kucinich, and Duncan Hunter all qualified for and received funds. John McCain qualified for public funds in the primary and decided to reject them. Other major candidates elected not to participate because the contribution limits are too low. So what does all of this mean, and why am I explaining it to you? Well, as odd as it may seem, uh, that box on the front of the tax return has significance. It may have great significance to your client. It may mean nothing at all. But it's really not our job as a tax preparer to decide whether or not our client wants to contribute to that fund. It's our job to ask them the question, do you want to designate money to the fund? And then the client's going to say, what's the fund about? And then it would be your job to be able to explain the fund. So I'm explaining to you what the fund is so that you can in a due diligence fashion, explain to your client what the fund is, the purpose that it ha exists for, and then they'll let the client decide whether or not they want to check yes or no to that question. So why are reasons, or what are some reasons your client would say, yes, I want to contribute to the fund? Well, candidates who receive funds must agree not to accept more than a certain amount of money from private sources. The fund is intended to help equalize campaign money available to presidential candidates thereby making the field more diverse. Politically, you might believe that the fund is a good thing and that you want to support it. Reasons not to check the box include tax dollars spent on funding presidential election campaigns are diverted from other areas where they could be spent, such as national parks, the military, foreign aid, education, etc. You may not want to see the government spending money on presidential election campaigns. Signature. The IRS will only accept tax returns if they are signed by the taxpayer and spouse, if applicable. If you are a paid preparer, you must also sign and provide your name, preparer tax identification number, in the space provided. Now, these days, we're electronically filing tax returns, and so the client will sign the 8879 instead of the return. Either way, you as a preparer, you are required to have a, taxpayer, a preparer tax identification number, and you must enter it on the return. OK, so that concludes the lecture portion of today's class. The next point is to go on to classwork.
At this point, we're on page 22 of the student manual. And your job at this point is to determine if the following dependents are required to file a tax return. So go through and read through these problems and decide if these dependents are required to file a return. The second classwork assignment involves um, filing uh, requirements from Pub 17. So it says, determine if the following taxpayers are required to file a return. Use tables 1, 1 and 1, 2 to decide whether or not these individuals are required to file. So at this point, please push pause and complete classwork assignments number 1 and 2. And when you are finished preparing those assignments, please resume playback of the video and be ready for me to redo a review of the classwork assignment. OK, by now you should have finished your classwork assignment. If you have not, push pause and complete it. And then come back, and uh, I will now conduct a review of the answer key. Um, the final password I'm giving you today is the password to unlock the answer key for um, the session one classwork. So password to open session one classwork answer key is Gypsy. So if you jot that down, that is the third and final password that I'm giving you today. And you can use that to unlock the classwork answer key. But let's just take a look at what we have to say here for our assignments. Question number one, George, age 17, is a dependent. He had the following sources of income for the year. Wages, $36.25, interest of $79, and dividends of $13. Is George required to file a return? Well, the answer is no. George does not have to file because his total gross income is less than his wages, plus $300. His standard deduction is going to be $36.25, which is his wage income, plus $300. And that standard deduction is more than his total income, so he's not required to file. Number two, Kathy, age 21, is a full-time student and a dependent, and she had the following income for the year. Interest of 635 and dividends of 320, is she required to file? The answer is yes, because if you take Kathy's income and add it up, so this income right here, how much does that total? Well, it totals $955. And since it is more than $950, she is required to file. The next question, number three, Carl, age 67, is a dependent of his daughter, Martha. Carl had the following forms of income, $6,000 of non-taxable Social Security and pension of 3,000 interest of 173. Is he required to file a return? Yes, he is. The non-taxable Social Security is not playing into the income equation, but the pension and interest are, and those total $3,173. His standard deduction, however, is going to be $950 plus $1,400 for being age 65 or older. That gives him a standard deduction of $2,350, which is less than his income of $3,175. He is required to file. Nancy, age 18, is a dependent of her parents. And she had $4,400 of wages and a prize valued at $720. The amount was issued on a 1099 miscellaneous. Is she required to file? The answer is yes, because her Standard deduction is only going to be $4,400 plus $300 or $4,700. Her income is higher than that. Yes, she is required to file. Moving on to the next part of uh, our classwork assignment, we have classwork number two. And uh, what it says is to go to IRS Publication 17, page 4, to determine if the following taxpayers are required to file a return. None of these taxpayers is a dependent of someone else. So moving on with the first problem here, married filing joint age 55 for the filer, age 65 for the spouse, their gross income is $19,900. Are they required to file? Well, let's go in the manual then, and if I have mine right here, or you could open up Pub 17, and what you're looking for is where this filing uh, income puts them. So if I go in here and I'm looking on page 12 of the student manual, table 1-1, and it says, if one spouse is age 65 and the other spouse is um, under age 65, the filing requirement is $19,800. So that's what my finger's on right there. Their income is 199. dollars Are they required to file? Yes, they are, because the income is more than 198. Next question. Filer is single and age 69. The gross income is $9,700. Are th is that person required to file? Well, a single person under age, who is age 69 is required to file when the income hits 10750 
So the income is less than that. Therefore, this filer in problem number two is not required to file. Number three, single. Um, income, uh, age 18, income $9,400. Is this person required to file? Well, 9400 is more than 9350 so yes, number three is required to file. Number four, head of household. Um, age 18, gross income 11250 Is this person required to file? Well, the answer is no. If I go to single under age, uh, fifth, uh, under age 65, I see that the filing requirement is 12050 and 11250 is clearly less. So number four, no, not required to file. Number five, uh, married filing joint, one filer age 25, one filer age tw uh, 30, income 19,300. We move down to the married column. Income of 19,300 is more than 18,700, so yes, number five is required to file. Number six, qualifying widow age 67, gross income is $15,000, and so we move down to the very bottom table. The filing requirement for a paid, for a filer under age 65 who is a qualifying widow is 15,050. 15,000 is less than that, so no, number six is not required to file. But number seven, um, all of the same information. Actually, number six, the filing requirement is actually 16,150 because that filer is age 67. But then we move down to number seven, qualifying widow age 60. The income is more than $15,050, so yes, is required to file. Number nine, married filing joint. Both filers are under age um, 65. So we move back up on the table here, and we look under age 65 for both spouses. 18,700, the income is less than that. You will see, though, that they had $100 of tax withheld. Now, tax withholding would be a reason to file but you're not required to file. And that's what this question is about. Are we required to file or not? So we may choose not to file, but if we did file, then we'd have a refund. So that would be nice to get, wouldn't it? And then the final question, number 10, single, age 62, gross income of 79.50, um, no withholding. Is this person required to file? The answer is no. The income is less than 93.50. So at this point now, it's time to go into the LMS and enter the answers to these questions. And on the uh, instructional video or introduction to our course, I did show you how to do that. But I'm just going to navigate to the LMS one more time to show uh, those of you who are still trying to figure things out how you go about entering these problems into the test tab. So I'm going to go into session one inside the LMS. I'm going to go and enter, uh, open up classwork number one and uh, continue with my test. And here's how I do the classwork test for this problem. I'm going to answer the questions. Is George required to file? No. Is Kathy, age 21, required to file? Yes, she was. Is Carl required to file? Yes, he is. And is Nancy required to file? Yes, she is. So I'm going to submit all and finish. And let me see here. Thank goodness me, I got 100% on this, this test. So I'm ready to move on to the next classwork test. And uh, classwork number two, um, I'll go through. And this time, there are more questions. But I'm going to have to go through and answer all of these questions. And commit, submit and finish when I'm done. Um, the final element is a homework assignment. And the homework assignment is shown in your manual in the very last pages. It is on page 24 and 25 of your manual. And the homework assignment for questions numbers 1 through 4 is to use the tax tables in publication 17. And look up the tax tables that I showed you earlier in the lecture. And look up the amount of tax owed by Mr. J in number 1, Mr. and Mrs. H in number 2, and so on. And then you're going to use the tax rate schedule to calculate the tax manually for questions 5 through 8. So remember earlier when I did that example for a taxpayer with $100,000 of income and $90,000 of taxable income? You're going to do that yourself with this final assignment for homework. Of course, the password test is another test that you have to pass. And I've given you three passwords during today's lecture. You simply go into the password test, enter the uh, three passwords that I gave you. Remember that you have to enter the passwords according to the question. In today's class, I gave you the passwords in the same order they appear in the test. But do not assume that is always the case. Um, and when you're done with your password test, submit all and finish. So that concludes session one of the basic tax course. Thank you for joining me today. And I look forward to seeing you at the beginning of session two. Bye-bye.